Good evening. Very warm welcome and thank you for joining us uh, for this evening's Birmingham Energy Institute lecture series. Um, and this will be the conclusion of the very successful energy capital launch which has taken place uh, this afternoon. Delighted to be able to welcome you to this lecture on mission innovation, a 30 billion public funded programme for research and development into clean energy technologies. The Birmingham Energy Institute, which is hosting this evening's lecture, is the focal point for the University of Birmingham's uh, research in energy. And with our national and international partners, we aim to create change in the way we deliver, consume and think about energy. With over 140 academics engaged in energy research and development, the Institute is leading technological innovation as the UK seeks to develop sustainable energy solutions in transport, electricity and heat supply. Today has seen the launch of Energy Capital, a bold and inspiring new vision for energy in the West Midlands. The Energy Capital Initiative will unite all major stakeholders in energy technologies and systems to establish Greater Birmingham and the West Midlands as the global capital for energy systems innovation and market development associated with its energy, waste and transport infrastructures. Using new technologies that have been developed in collaboration with our partners, the Birmingham Energy Institute will create large-scale demonstrators to integrate energy vectors, including electricity, heat, liquid air and hydrogen. Within the Energy Capital Initiative, uh, the Energy and Environmental Enterprise District in Tisley will become the energy transport and waste nexus for the city of Birmingham. This will be realised through the Birmingham Energy Institute's collaboration with the Energy Research Accelerator, Birmingham City Council and the Energy Systems Catapult. So that's some of the background and some of the context. And now I'm delighted formally to welcome our speaker, Professor Sir David King, the Foreign Secretary's Special Representative on Climate Change, who will describe the Mission Innovation Programme. Sir David will talk about its processes to accelerate energy research by leveraging investment and talk about how energy capital might participate in that vision. Of course, David needs no introduction but I'm going to introduce him nonetheless. Uh, he has had an enormously distinguished uh, career. He was appointed as the UK Foreign Secretary's Special Representative for Climate Change in September 2013. Sir David was previously the government's Chief Scientific Advisor from 2000-2007. That's how we first got to know uh, one another. And during his time uh, as the uh, GSA, David um, raised awareness of the need for governments to act on climate change and was instrumental in creating the Energies Technolo Technologies Institute. He went on to serve as founding director of the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment at the University of Oxford from 2008 to 2012. Some other appointments have included chair of the Future Cities Catapult, chancellor of the University of Liverpool, senior advisor to UBS and advisor uh, to the President of Rwanda. He is, of course, a distinguished chemist, and perhaps his greatest claim to fame is having taught our provost, Professor Tim Jones. <laughs> so David has been... He was a bit of a delay, actually, in that. Um, uh, so David has been elected uh, to numerous positions of eminence, including the Fellowship of the Royal Society in 1991, uh, Foreign Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2002. In 2003, he was knighted for his work in science. Um, and in 2009, he was made officier of the French Légion d'Honneur for his work on climate and the energy challenge. He's the author of over 500 papers. Um, uh, and remarkably, he holds 23 honorary degrees from universities around the world. So who better uh, to speak uh, on uh, this uh, challenging topic of mission, of, of mission innovation 
uh, than uh, Sir David. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Sir Professor Sir David King. Well, David, thank you very much. I, I cannot imagine having a better audience to talk to on uh, the, this topic, mission innovation. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to go back to the time when I was government chief scientific advisor and started work on, on this issue of climate change uh, because I, th I think we all need to understand the urgency of the issue that I'm discussing with you. Um, and so I, I need to uh, present the risks so that we can understand why we need to act and act quickly. So I start with something that happened while I was uh, chief scientific advisor. Uh -huh. And what I'm referring to was the single most catastrophic natural disaster in Central Europe on record. If you can measure natural disasters by the number of fatalities, something like 60,000 people lost their lives in this disaster. And many people are looking at me saying, I don't remember a disaster in Central Europe in 2003. Quite simply, unlike a tsunami, it didn't happen like that. It rolled out over a period of six weeks. And this was the hot summer of 2003. Um, and I'm just showing you here, uh, in, in black, the average Central Summer European temperature from 1900 uh, through to 2003. And the black cross marks that high temperature point in 2003. As a matter of fact, I got the Met Office to produce this graph for me at that time. And what they superimposed with it was their weather prediction model. And I'm sure you physicists understand it's a heroic model. It predicts the weather for the whole planet. It is reinitiated every six hours. And it's reinitiated with data from satellites and from uh, aircraft around the world every six hours. It takes that length of time to reinitiate the program. And I simply asked them, by this time they had just introduced greenhouse gases into the model. So it means that with a single model, you can do tomorrow's weather for the world, but you can also run it forward and do predictions on climate change. So the first thing was to run the model backwards in time to see how well they, the model without any tuned parameters could deliver that black curve you've just seen. And I think you can all see that that's not a bad description, so it gives you a bit of confidence if you then ask them to run the model forward in time. And you'll see the, the, the prediction is that by about 2040, 2050, the average summer temperature in Central Europe will be the same as that disastrously hot temperature in 2003. <clears throat> now, for those of you who are wondering why there are so many red curves, I asked them to reinitiate two weeks apart three times. And that was deliberately to show the difference between weather and climate change. So uh, there are many people who get rather muddled about this point. None of the physicists here are, I know. But th the point, of course, is that predicting tomorrow's weather is OK. Predicting the weather in two weeks' time is pretty bad. So the, what looks like noise on the graph is the more chaotic weather. And the trend on the graph is what we're worried about in terms of greenhouse gases. And of course, this is looking at a particular forward scenario, the medium to high emissions scenario. And I'm going to say that while this looks like a, a, a six degree temperature rise by the end of the century, that we're actually not in a very different place today. This was 2003. So I would say this is roughly the scenario we are on as we progress forward in time. Uh, now, that, that in itself represents a major challenge because we need to deal with this. I'm just showing now uh, NASA data that I picked up in uh, May last year <coughs> uh, showing the a a global average temperature uh, going back to uh, 1880 up to the present time. We could discuss the bit of the curve that's colored uh, uh, yellow, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. 
the number of measurements being made during the Second World War was not as great as the number on either side of it, so it's not really strictly comparable. But I, I think the important thing, of course, is the temperature rise today is already 1.1 degrees. The so-called <clears throat> pause in the, in the global warming, uh, you, we can see now, was an, uh, that, that corruption of the data produced by the El Nino uh, effects and the La Nina effects. And so we, we, we can see that we're actually on track with the previous graph I've just shown you. Uh, it's within the close error bars of the predicted uh, curve from 2003. When we look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, the one thing you can quickly pick up on is that it's a scientific report. And scientists like to predict things accurately, and they don't like to talk about things that have low probabilities. But of course, when we talk about risk, when I was chief scientific advisor, I had to deal with low probability risks that would have a high impact. So actually, when we talk about climate change, that's precisely what we need to be doing. So I began, when I came back into government, working in particular with Simon Sharp, who was the project manager, uh, I began a, a, a study in which we used expertise from actuaries and from statisticians uh, why actuaries? We brought in the reinsurance companies, uh, in particular Willis Ree was involved. Uh, we brought them in because, as I'm sure everyone here knows, if you own a house, you take out an insurance policy, not because you think it's got a 50% chance of burning down during the coming year, but because even if it's a 0.001% chance, the impact on your personal economy is quite large. So that, that's the kind of approach we took in this uh, risk assessment. It's been published, it's available on the website, um, and it is something that you need a few stiff drinks before you actually read it through. Uh, there were 120 of us working on this for about a year, and we drew in experts and admirals and generals and security, senior security advisors. Uh, we drew in actuarial people, we drew in a range of people who were particularly political advisors to the governments of China and India. And <clears throat> so with this team of 120 producing this report, we, we took a very different approach from the IPCC. What we did, I gave lectures on climate change to these assembled people, and then we asked them to go back to their governments and say, given what we understand about climate change, what is the worst thing that it might throw at your economy? And the, the uh, two governments were very responsive to this, and in particular the Chinese government. The Chinese government came back with four particular challenges. Uh, one of the challenges was that in a given year, all rice crops fail in China. Uh, that was something we could get the uh, uh, crop scientists to tell us about. If you get to a temperature of about 32 to 34 degrees during the flowering season of the rice, it doesn't produce fruit. So, you know, we use that as the basis for our analysis. Uh, they were worried about simply high temperatures producing a 2003 European event, but not with 50,000 people dying, but with many millions of people dying. Uh, they were worried about rising sea levels, uh, meaning that people would have to move their place of normal abode. And if you think of China with one and a half billion people, you might think only a small number. No, we came up with half a billion people at risk from uh, uh, severe flooding, all with fairly low probabilities of happening, at least in the early term. But of course, as we know with climate change, we cannot talk about a risk assessment being a timeless process. We can no longer talk about this as being a one in 300 year event. We have to talk about it in a dynamic way, and so our analysis was based on probability as a function of time. <clears throat> and I'm going to not take you right through this analysis at all, but just look at this uh, point, for example. The probability of exceeding four degrees centigrade. At four degrees centigrade, all of the risks that the Chinese government raised with us became really well above 1% in a given year. Uh, and the most sensitive is rice crop failure. 
even half a degree temperature above the present level <coughs> is uh, uh, reaching more than a 1% chance of happening in a given year. Now, you can see that if we carry on business as usual, the red curve, these are the IPCC curves, but we've reconfigured it into probability as a function of time. The probability that in a given year the temperature will rise above 4 degrees above the uh, pre-industrial level uh, is approaching 1% when we get to mid-century. And <clears throat> on these better behaved curves, the mustard and the pale blue, it doesn't look too comfortable either. So the IPCC, looking at the 50% chance only, would tend to say, and I'm not saying they do this all the time, but that is the general rule, they would say that the purple curve is taking us through to 2150 uh, and keeping us below 4 degrees centigrade. What this is saying is, no, actually 40% of the time of the years, we're going to experience that sort of temperature. So we, we look at the dark blue curve and say that's the one we ought to be on. Right? Now, this was in the run-up to that COP meeting in Paris, and I, I would say this was a critically important part of achieving the form of the agreement that we got in Paris. I just compare here the two degrees and the four degrees because <clears throat> the Paris agreement ended up not just buying two degrees. Right, so if we look at the two degrees curve, you'll see again the dark blue curve looks pretty good out to the middle of the next century. That's approaching the 1% level. Um, but even the, the uh, uh, sorry, uh, on, on the left-hand side, greater than two degrees, we, we see that the two degrees is 35%, even by the time we get to just past mid-century. Um, if we... Uh, 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 look at that as a limit. So even on the best behaved curve going forward, the dark blue curve, the probability is that we're hitting two degrees centigrade uh, once in two to three years <coughs> above the pre-industrial level. Sea level rise <coughs> is the big challenge, of course, to every island nation. And uh, I was representing Britain at the Pacific Islands Forum where the uh, Prime Ministers of the, all the Pacific Islands and of Australia and, and New Zealand were there. And I was able to stand up and say, actually, we are an island nation as well. And it's rising sea levels that are the biggest threat to the United Kingdom. Now, I'm just showing you here on the left-hand side, rising sea levels we cannot be complacent about. If we look at the... Uh, the, the blue curve going forward, uh, the RCP 2.6, uh, you'll see that within the error margin there, we still continue to see sea levels rising beyond 2100. Uh, and so it, here in the UK, we have to manage rising sea levels. We have to manage that as part of our adaptation process. I haven't got the next century, but it keeps rising to well beyond the, the middle of the next century. On the right-hand side are the, uh, <coughs> the more concerning issues around the polar ice caps. So the, the top curve, published about three years ago now, uh, by a, a group of scientists who are world leaders in this field, <coughs> shows the possibility that we, the probability that we reach the point where irreversible of green, uh, Greenland ice melting begins to occur. Now, irreversible Greenland ice melting, that sounds a bit dramatic, because if all of that ice melts, the sea level rise rises by 6.5 metres globally average. <clears throat> but of course, that's not going to happen overnight. There's no timeline on the, that curve at the top right-hand side. The green curves represent the 95% probability uh, uh, allowance on the, on the graph. Why would Greenland ice start melting irreversibly? Because of what's already happening. So we, we've lost a very big proportion of the summer Arctic sea ice already. That means the albedo, the reflectivity of sunlight has changed dramatically, <clears throat> going from 90% to less than 10, uh, from 90% to less than 10% reflectivity. And that means the Arctic has already heated up more than twice the global average. Uh, and as we heat up the ocean around Greenland, we're, get, we're beginning to see the formation of lakes 
on the top of Greenland. Now, of course, there's a positive feedback effect there. As the lakes get deeper, they get deeper blue, and they absorb more and more sunlight. And so th this is a curve based on that phenomenon, uh, accelerating the, the loss of the entire Greenland I I I ice sheet. Timeline not given in the paper, and their estimate is anywhere for the complete melting between 200 years and 2,000 years. And I'd like to emphasize to people that actually in the timeline of our civilization, 2,000 years isn't all that long. Um, so we, we shouldn't really write off uh, uh, the, the future. But then the, what, what we've got in the bottom gray cur curve is summing up the green curve and the pink curve. The pink curve is the loss of ice from land-based ice in the Antarctic. And of course, the sum total of that means that you're looking at sea level rise in the many meters of level uh, as this all happens. Now, when we did our risk analysis program with the Chinese and uh, Indian governments, <coughs> we were also asked to look at risk for cities. Now, we predicted that Calcutta would be the first city that would be severely underwater. Now, we published this, and one month later, they had the worst floods in history. So we, we're not far from the mark, and it's not too difficult to predict because it's not the rising sea level. It's storms at sea with rising sea level. It's those infrequent low probability events that cause the real damage. And that's really the justification for this actuarial approach to, uh, to the whole problem. Now, I, let me just finish quickly by saying how the Chinese and the Indians reacted. Well, the Chinese government has taken this into their own hands now. We're not working with them directly all the time. They've got a two-year program to take this into a second phase. Um, they are arriving in London on Monday, and we're working with them in London uh, for the week uh, to... to really go through their analyses that they're conducting. Uh, the Indian government, perhaps very interestingly, have taken this into a second phase as well, into their Department for Defense and their security services. So why are those, they so concerned about the security aspects of this? Well, quite simply, part of the analysis shows that Bangladesh goes uh, uh, severely underwater uh, as we move forward in time. Severely underwater, I'm talking about, again, extreme weather events. Um, and the worry is that the migration that we're seeing in Europe today will become magnified by, there would be 200 million people possibly looking for alternative places to live. So <clears throat> then I, I just need to mention uh, the, the systemic risks that we also had to look at. So it was all very well saying to governments, what would you really be worried about? But the next thing is, they're all driven by the same thing, climate change. So what happens if these events multiply in a single year? Now, the biggest rice paddy fields in the world are in the Mekong Delta in, uh, in Vietnam. And they, they are in the Mekong Delta, which means that they are uh, uh, really at risk from rising sea levels. Now, if there are storms at sea, uh, uh, and we again did this analysis as a function of future time, storms at sea, you salinate the rice paddy fields and that's the end of the rice production from those uh, paddy fields. So what if that happens at the same time as China is on the international market buying uh, food crop products for their people? Well, of course, it means that the global economy becomes severely at risk. People will put up Trade barriers, it will all begin, can I use the phrase, it'll begin to go pear-shaped. And there is a sense in which by the time we looked at systemic analyses, it was difficult to see how in a business-as-usual scenario we would survive as a, a civilization that we would recognize today by the end of the century. So it's, uh, it's quite a, a serious way of looking at the, the whole problem. If you look at these low probability events, but a low probability event that's becoming worse and worse in probability in, in time. Now, we then had the Paris meeting, and uh, there in that Pacific Island meeting, when I was representing the British position, uh, in agreement with the British government, 
I changed our position and said, the Pacific Islanders are aiming for no more than 1.5 degrees, temperature rise above the pre-industrial level. The rest of the world wanted two degrees, and I simply said, we would back the Islanders with saying less than two degrees, and we'll aim for 1.5. Now, one reason for saying this is that as we approach 1.5 degrees, the irreversible melting of the Greenland ice cap really becomes teased into that 1% level. And I frankly don't think we should look, uh, hope for luck in, uh, in managing this exercise. Right. So there's, if you like, my unrealistic challenge. Can we make a 1.5 degree centigrade target? Uh, now, let's, uh, let's take that on board. The Paris Agreement, I've just stated the long-term goal. Emissions, we accepted nationally determined contributions produced by each country. I want to quickly say, this doesn't mean that countries just put them on the table. Um, in three and a half years, in my present position, I've made 90 official country visits speaking to governments. And we have cultural attaches, climate attaches in our embassies around the world, working full-time with governments on managing this process. We have an international climate fund set up by Prime Minister Cameron uh, with initially four billion pounds and he added another 5.8 billion pounds in October 2015, just before the Paris Agreement. No other country is, has done as much to achieve the results in Paris, I would suggest, as the British government. French diplomacy was superb on the day but the work done ahead of time, I would say, was very much uh, <coughs> led by the British government. But nevertheless, I'm going to come and show you in a moment what adding up those NDCs actually means. And having done that homework myself, before we actually got into Paris, I pushed very hard for the third part of this agreement that I pulled out here, which is a review mechanism. We have to be able to add it all up and then say, wait a minute, adding up to the nationally determined contributions doesn't match up to the desire to stay at the 2 to 1.5 degree level. So we need a review mechanism. That was also accepted. So 2018, we start the review process. 2020, countries can only, according to the review mechanism, make their ambition tougher, reduce their CO2 emissions going forward in time, their greenhouse gas emissions. They can't say, for one reason or another, we're going to go above it. So the review mechanism is also part of the process. I've left out other, other parts of the agreement that were reached. And I'm just highlighting here the UK leadership at home. We first of all had to show that we were serious about this and uh, I was heavily involved as chief science advisor trying to <laughs> devise a system that would really hold solid going forward in time. And it took seven years. And finally, 2008, Climate Change Act of Parliament. Let me say, I think that's a brilliant piece of legislation because it commits future governments. We had all party agreement. We had four votes in Parliament against and 465 in favor of that motion. That says by 2050, we will have reduced our emissions by 80% and it's binding on all future governments. We set up a climate change committee with a climate change office of experts, 30 experts in government in Whitehall. And the climate change committee sets carbon budgets into the future every four stroke five years. And the budgets go as far as they can, right? Why? We had the private sector saying to us, if we're going to invest in low carbon energies, we need to know that the future of that pathway is secure. We want that pathway set out. And we need to know it's secure against changing governments as well. And we've now had, I've now served four prime ministers and we haven't changed one bit of this process. Right, so it is working. We have reduced our emissions by 32% so far compared with 1990 levels. And the latest commitment is for 2032, a 57% reduction accepted and acted on by May's government in the first week she was in, in government. Our newspapers don't write about these things. Right. The, the 
Green Climate Fund, which is set up in, in Korea, was under the United Nations Framework Convention. It's meant to rise to $100 billion a year by 2020. And the British government so far has contributed $1.2 billion to that. The total sum standing in that budget at the moment is $10.4 billion. We got very impatient with that. It wasn't being operated on. And so we set up our own national fund called the International Climate Fund, just to be confusing. And the reason we called it the International Climate Fund is that that money cannot be sent, spent in Britain. It can only be spent overseas. And <clears throat> this is the fund I've already mentioned that David Cameron <coughs> financed to a total of $13 billion, and we've spent about $5 billion of that to date. <clears throat> I'm simply saying... That was critically important to have that money available. Governments have, were very keen to talk to us because we had deep pockets and were able to help them make this transition into clean energy systems and to build up resilience to uh, changing climates, which is how most of that money has been spent. We're also now the first country to commit to a coal phase out. No further electricity production will take place through burning coal after 2025. Now, it is true that that is because our last coal power stations come to the end of their lifetime at that point. But this is a very important part of having this long-term projection forward because any infrastructure we build today that is heavy in carbon dioxide emissions is no longer going to be fit for purpose as we move forward in time. So we really had to manage that uh, that process in order to achieve the cheapest transition of all. So we don't build infrastructure now that isn't fit for purpose in a clean energy world. Now here's the crucial curve, um, <clears throat> and I finally got to it, and I apologize, I'll get to mission innovation. If you add up all of the nationally determined contributions and take land use out of each national contribution, you get the, the, uh, and then add land use in as a single sum, and I'll explain why that's been done, you get the top yellow dotted curve out to 2030, and then let's be a little optimistic and accelerate the drop after that so that you can hit close to zero by 2100. That's how that curve was produced, and that curve corresponds to a 3.7 to 4 degree temperature rise. Uh, that's nowhere near the no more than 2 and close to 1.5. And then if you say, all right, we want the uh, uh, 1.5 degree curve, <coughs> that's the pale green one here. <clears throat> now you can see that the pale green curve cuts through every nationally determined contribution. So in other words, if we're going to stay on the pale green curve, all of these nationally determined contributions will have to be revised severely downwards. The transition has to take place so that we reach net zero by 2035 if we're going seriously for 1.5 degrees. And let me then say that's with a 50% chance. So if we're unlucky, it's going to be higher. The blue curve is the uh, 2 degrees centigrade objective with uh, a... 67% chance, and the red one with a 50% chance. Whatever you look at, you know that we've got to be on a pathway that matches somewhere around those three curves if we're really going to be serious about managing this problem. So why have I taken out land use change? Very quickly, just to say, that is mostly deforestation. So deforestation today is equivalent uh, to more than the emissions from the United States at the moment. Now, Britain, working with Germany and Norway, created the so-called GNU program, Germany, Norway, and the United Kingdom. Uh, and that program invited all forested nations to sign up to an investment of about $6 billion. We created that fund out using our International Climate Fund. This wasn't more money. We've got 37 forested nations signed up to a commitment not only to avoid all deforestation 
but to reforest an area that altogether will amount to the size of India. And when we have achieved that, 2030 is the objective, this will be a carbon sink equivalent to all of the emissions from the US today. Now, if we're going to get to net zero, we need this additional carbon sink. Very simple arithmetic uh, tells you that. So there's the, the position. I needn't go through all of the co-benefits. Having clean air to breathe is the obvious co-benefit of uh, switching away from uh, uh, fossil fuels. And in China and India, this is a very big driver. Uh, but in, in most of our cities, we're breathing a lot of NOx gases in, and uh, it's not very good for us. Here's the key to what has been happening. And I'm now going to say, what will accelerate this program is creating a commercial reality out of the clean energy world, where, by which I mean it becomes cheaper to install clean energy than to use fossil fuels. Right? I, and I'm suggesting that that is becoming a reality far quicker than anyone had predicted. Now, 1989, Germany introduced feed-in tariffs onto the grid. It was a, a tremendously brave attempt to foresee a world of clean energy, and they thought if they got into it first, the technologies would be produced by their industries for the whole world. Now, we all know the story. Photovoltaics began to be produced in Germany, but then were taken over by Chinese production. China, Chinese companies actually bought up all the German and other European uh, photovoltaic producers that were active. But this overall process of price falling for photovoltaics, for wind turbines on land, for wind turbines off land, uh, for LEDs leading the way since 2008, all of this price reduction has been driven through very largely by regulatory systems of the countries in Europe, creating a bigger and bigger market, and as the market expanded, the prices fell. More and more competitors coming in, and of course, sophistication improving in the technologies going through. But of course, that process led, first of all, through some very big victories, 2014 across the whole world. If you look at new energy installation for electricity production, more than half was from clean energy. Now, I'm telling you that is not because of all of those companies were trying to meet any obligations about climate change. That's because it was commercially competitive. However, <coughs> and you'll see in Britain we're doing pretty well, 45 billion turnover, employing a quarter of a million people in the clean energy sector. But Feed-in tariffs did nothing for energy storage technologies, did nothing for smart grids. All you had to do was feed into the grid. And there's no regulatory system we could come up with that could deliver for the entire energy system everything it needed to get to net zero carbon. And so finally, and very late, I come to the program I'm really meant to be talking to you about. Originally, we called it the Global Apollo Program. My idea was, was quite simple, that uh, the Apollo Program set up by President Kennedy was a time-dependent program. In 10 years, we are going to land a man on the moon. It was mission-orientated. All of those people working on the program were working to achieve an objective. And I'm simply saying we have a very clear and similar objective, except that now it's our futures at stake. Right? So that's why I chose the word Apollo. Prime Minister Modi didn't like the word Apollo. Uh, and you would have to ask him and his advisors why he didn't like it. He's the one who changed the name to Mission Innovation. And so on the first day of the Paris meeting, this took off in a way that I have to say I was battling to make happen. <coughs> but it finally took off handsomely when I launched the Global Apollo program, got David Attenborough there to comment on it. Everyone reported on what he'd said, and then Obama invited him to be interviewed in the White House by President Obama. And in that interview, Attenborough asks Obama to join the Global Apollo program. 
Obama says yes, and then everyone fell into line. So you've got the commitment, which uh, David, you mentioned, $30 billion per annum, because a country joining had to promise to double its research, development, and demonstration public funding in clean energy technologies by 2020, 2021. We've actually uh, gone a bit beyond $30 billion today, but of course we don't know what the Trump administration uh, response to mission innovation is going to be. My own feeling is he's likely to stay with it because it's going to make money for US companies. Now, the next part of mission innovation, you'll see that there's one non-head of state amongst those people standing there between the Canadian Prime Minister and the US Prime Minister, uh, President is, uh, is Bill Gates. And there's probably the most remarkable phone call I will ever have, this uh, voice saying, I'm Bill Gates and I rather like the notion of Global Apollo program and I'd like to put a billion dollars of my private money down as investment into the new technologies that emerge to assist them to get rapidly into the marketplace. And he then arrived on that first day in Paris with 27 co-signatories of wealthy individuals around the world, two of whom are British, uh, two of whom are African, two Indians. So he worked hard to see that he had uh, two are Chinese, a fully representative group of people corresponding to the countries that had joined Mission Innovation. So behind this $30 billion per annum, we've now got a billion dollars in operation. It's going to rise to much more than that as the program rolls forward. <coughs> so here, to me, is the message to the scientific community. There's a challenge on, and it's a short-term challenge. My original program was a 10-year program. That's the timeline I think we have, but the international agreement I mean, the, the agreement of the 22 countries plus the EC doesn't go for the 10 years. They think I'm a bit too ambitious. But I'm appealing to the scientific community here. We need your ideas. We need your research. And we need to know where collaborative research amongst the 22 nations plus the European Commission can be most productive. Uh, we all know roughly what the priorities are, but Within this overall electricity production model shown here, I think all of these can be subject to, to new developments that will be groundbreaking. So I, I think we can include renewables, but storage and transmission are my favorites. I think energy efficiency, all of these. But then we met in London, uh, all 22 nations plus the EC, to discuss what programs of work we should first start off with in collaboration. So each country is going to do its own work, and you guys will be determined by whatever funding agency you go to. But we also decided we would look for collaborative areas. And the, the, the decision on a collaborative area was at least seven of the 22 countries had to say they would collaborate on this program. And so here are the seven areas that we agreed in London uh, uh, last autumn. And each of these areas now has two countries agreeing to lead on the collaborative arrangements, which means setting up workshops, conferences uh, around the world. We've had one mission innovation ministerial in San Francisco last June, and the second uh, mission innovation ministerial will take place in Beijing, <coughs> 7th and 8th of June. And just to give you an indication as to how important China sees this, they are going to hold this meeting of only 22 ministers and an EC representative in the biggest conference hall in Beijing. They've got 5,000 square meters of demonstrator space, so please, if you want to demonstrate what you're doing, go there. And they're inviting mayors and provincial leaders and so on. Uh, from around the world. So there will be other people inside meetings to pursue this idea. Now you will see from this list that it's fairly broad. Uh, we need scientific input to sharpen down on, on each one of these things. Uh, Britain is leading on number seven, heating and cooling, because we think that's the biggest challenge. Yes, energy storage, yes, smart grids, but heating and cooling, we need to manage that with zero emissions. 
And uh, that, that means if we're relying on gas, carbon capture and storage has to be relied on. I'm not too happy about that myself, but we can have a discussion. But all of these will emerge during this year with workshops and conferences. And of course, if we look at energy storage, and this is just an example, you will also know there are many different solutions required. We need solutions that provide kilowatt hours of storage, let's say 10 kilowatt hours for a, quite a large household, but we need energy storage that goes for large-scale country energy storage, tens of gigawatt hours uh, uh, are needed in Britain. We would be very happy if we had smart grids managing the business of electricity production to uh, demand to supply, but if we also had about um, 100 gigawatt hours of energy storage freely available to us, we could then go to 100% renewables. Now, I, have, I will, will briefly mention nuclear. Right, I've done it. <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm against nuclear. I've been accused of being a nuclear salesman. Um, cost target, absolutely critical. Less than $100 per kilowatt hour to install. So all of these things have to be market-facing. So price is absolutely critical as we, as we move forward through the program. Just a quick point about the roles of the Breakthrough Energy Coalition and of large companies. I believe this is going to roll out from places like this. You know which companies you can work with. You will develop the interactions. The companies will know there's a surge of funding coming in to you to do these programs of work. Uh, and large companies can get things into the marketplace much more quickly than spin-out companies which famously take many years to produce anything that is market-facing. However, large companies are also problematic when it comes to uh, breakthrough technologies that might um, impair their ability to keep making money in the old way. So I do believe we need this combination of breakthrough energy style funding, venture capital if you, if you like, to set up small companies round universities in particular, emerging from this work, but also there's a critically important role for large companies. I set this up uh, in an editorial last January, in, if you like, in the euphoria of the agreement reached in Paris. There was no certainties about that agreement. Um, and that was also a euphoria before recent <coughs> events in um, our own country, and in the United States. I think that I've just gone over the point I'm allowed to. So here, I was very pleased with the editor of Science setting it up under this heading, my opinion editorial, biggest opportunity of our age. And that's the final point I want to make. We're looking at an opportunity for wealth creation like we haven't had since the Industrial Revolution. We're talking about two to three trillion dollars a year by 2020 of investment into clean energy infrastructure around the world. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, is estimating that by 2035 we will have spent 53 trillion dollars globally in this area. Other estimates range up to 75 trillion dollars. Whichever estimate you look at, it puts every other wealth creating opportunity into the shade. This is enormous because the energy industry is vast. So I think the, the opportunities are there. Now let me just finish by saying something about energy storage. So here's an idea that's already emerged from Professor Heindel in Germany. He's a mining engineer and he very, <laughs> you see this quickly. He very simply says, well, I know using current mining technologies how to mine out of a piece of flat ground a granite cylinder, and I can then up-pump that granite cylinder with water when I've got excess electricity and use the weight of the granite to drive the water through the turbines on the right when I need electricity. If that measures 150 meters in diameter, 250 meters deep, you're storing up to uh, a, gigawatt, uh, a gigawatt hour a billion watt hours of electricity. So we would need uh, uh, 100 of these in the UK. 
right, to, to do the storage we, we, we want. Now, at the moment, we're busy putting an interconnector across to Norway. The Norwegians are building new uh, dams up in their mountains, and we're then going to take stored energy from Norway. Uh, that's the world's longest underwater interconnector. Um, and if this kind of technology emerges, then we're going to do it in-house. Now, I'll give you another one that I am rather fond of. Uh, this is a British company, Verilift, and they, they're building an airship. Uh, nothing new about the technology here except that they've grasped a nettle. Uh, it's one of the very few airships with an aluminium frame. 0.7 millimeter aluminium. They've managed to learn how to weld it well. Uh, and inside that frame, there are 12 compartments, uh, and each compartment has an airbag, a helium cylinder, a compressor. So when you want to take off, you release helium into the airbags. The dead weight is about 100 tons. So there's the price you pay. But the advantage is the rooftop is stable. All right, so I'll give you a little scenario. You go to pick up tomatoes in Spain. At the moment, we bring tomatoes from Spain to Britain with a wide belly jumbo jet. With this, you fly over the tomato fields of Spain. It's got an onboard crane. You lift the container of full of tomatoes up into the hold. You can get 20 ship's containers into the hold. Uh, you now move across to Britain and you lower onto each of the depots of Sainsbury's and Tesco's the fresh tomatoes from the tomato field. You don't have to land this thing. Under w uh, high winds, you might have to tether it. But one of the advantages of the heavy weight is it's like a ship liner. It's not going to be blown around by, by the wind. So there are big advantages in that uh, dead weight. Now, how does it move from Spain to Britain? Well, it's got photovoltaics, of course, over the top. And it's flying at 40,000 feet high. Very little air resistance up there. And it's intercepting enough solar energy, it's 220 meters by 75 meters, to run the engines that you see, electric engines, to get the craft moving, uh, they're estimating fully loaded 340 kilometers an hour. Uh, this isn't sluggish. Right? This is actually the sort of thing that, if it comes into the marketplace, is likely to be groundbreaking. So I want to leave you with that. There'll be many, many suggestions from, from yourselves, and I'm interested to hear them. Um, but I, I, I thank you for listening. I, I've gone beyond my time, and I apologize for that.